Did you ever have a teacher at school when you were young who really made a positive, long lasting impact in your life? And if you did, what did that teacher actually do? What things did that teacher do to make them so memorable, to make them so great? Did they have a special kind of recipe to make them so great? What is the recipe to becoming a really great teacher? <laughs> Let's discover together. <laughs> I'm Miranda and I teach young children English as a second language through drama. And today I have a very special guest with me all the way from the United States to share with us his teaching experience and to let us in on the secrets of the things that great teachers do. In a moment, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Nick Furman, who is a professor of environmental education at the University of Georgia in the United States. He teaches animals. Uh, oh no, wait a minute, <laughs> let me rephrase that. He doesn't teach animals, he teaches students about animals. And I know that you might be thinking, well, what has an expert in animals got to do with teaching children English? Well, I believe that it, regardless of whatever subject you're teaching, whether it's maths or English or art or music or whatever, it's really how you teach that subject that makes a difference in children's lives. And Dr. Nick Furman, or Ranger Nick, how he is also known, is an expert in this field. He is a motivational speaker, he is a TV personality, and he's even done a fantastic TEDx talk on this subject, on the subject of teaching uh, students and what are the, the, uh, the, the, the things that makes a great teacher, what special things do great teachers always do? And he's going to share with us these secrets together with us today. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Ranger Nick and I'll have him join us. <laughs> Hello, good morning, Ranger Dick. Nick. Well, hey, Miss Miranda, I tell you what, I so appreciate that intro and hearing that Ranger Nick never gets old. That means so much more than Dr. Furman any day. I got to tell you, <laughs> that is my favorite. And I'll tell you all why it's my favorite, but thanks so much for having me on. And thanks so much for just doing so much research on me and my background. And that means a lot. It really, really does. And and folks that are listening, thanks for taking a couple minutes to spend some time together. I got to tell you, my favorite thing in the world to do is teach. I mean, over anything else, any hobby. And it is such a passion of mine. I want to tell a little bit about my story, how I got into this. Please and do. Please do. Yeah. We can't wait. Well, this, <laughs> I, I appreciate it. There's a You were talking, Miss Miranda, about the power of a teacher, a favorite teacher. And if we think about a favorite teacher of ours, if you had to think about phrases, words that come to mind when you think of that person, usually you don't think about that person being the most smart or technical expert in their field. You don't think about that person knowing all the jargon in their discipline. You think about the environment maybe that that person created in the classroom. You think about their personality and their ability to connect with folks and the ability that they had to care about others. And that's something I shared in that TED Talk. I'd encourage you to check it out. It was such a humbling thing to get asked to do that. Man, what a neat thing. And I talk a lot about the power of that thing about caring. But I gotta tell you, so there is this one guy when I was seven years old in Maryland in the United States. I was seven, I was in elementary school. We had these little carpet squares, these little sections of carpet that we were all sitting on. And we got the carpet squares out when we were having a guest speaker come to class. And this guy was called Ranger Bill. And Ranger Bill was a park ranger who used animals as ambassadors of educational messages. And he brought these animals in, an owl and a hawk and a vulture and a turtle and a snake and all this stuff. And he used them as an ambassador, as a teaching tool to share with us things about the environment. And the way he did it, he was really edutaining. And I love that word, if that is a word, he was educating us, but gosh, he was using humor and his body language and just his enthusiasm. That's contagious. 
And so he did all this. And I remember all of my friends and I were just there thinking, man, this guy is the coolest guy. Well, I went home and I told my parents about him. And I thought, we got to go see Ranger Bill again somewhere near our house. So he would come to the library or he would come to a, a local camp or festival and bring the animals. And we would go and watch him. So then finally, we got up the courage to my parents said, look, can our son do anything to help you, Ranger Bill? Because he just loves what you're doing. So for many years, I cleaned a lot of cages, okay, to be around this guy. And owls and hawks and vultures and turtles and stuff are kind of dirty. But I did all that because I wanted to be around Ranger Bill. And eventually, when I turned 16, he said, Nick, why don't we just hire you? This is all you've ever done. This is all you've ever been around is teaching and animals and shadowing him. And so he did. He hired me. I went out and started using animals and teaching and did that for the next seven years as a, a job. And then went off to college and discovered that I loved the ability to connect with folks. But as Ranger Nick, and I'll always remember when I was first called Ranger Nick by a guy with the news who was interviewing me. I was standing there holding an owl and he called me Ranger Nick. And I was like, man, I finally made it. You know, like that's so cool. But I tell you what, the Ranger Nick thing I did in Maryland, I only got to see audiences for like an hour and then I left. So I never got to know if I made a difference or not. And it was becoming a classroom teacher now as a college professor that I get to see that difference. And so some of the things I want to share with you, things that I think matter when it comes to teaching. The first thing I think that really is important, and some of these are in that TED Talk. I won't share all of them, but just a couple of things. One of the things is to celebrate teachable moments. Don't you just love that word, that phrase, teachable moments? We do. Moments? I love that. You know, you make a mistake as a teacher, just call it a teachable moment. I mean, if something doesn't go right, okay, well, what went wrong? Let's talk about this as a learning opportunity and move on. Well, in my classes at the University of Georgia, I work with college students and everybody has some level of public speaking anxiety, everybody, because we care about sharing what we know with others. Well, college students that have to present in front of their peers, especially experience anxiety, and I get it, because you got to see these people again. You know, if you do something, you goof it up, oh, I got to see them again next week. So I use animals in class to help overcome anxiety. So I'm going to show you one. So I brought with me my friend Sharon. Sharon's one of the critters that lives at our house. I'm so thankful. And I'm Sharon. I'm Sharon, Sharon with you here. She's back here in my office. So like, look, and, and I'll tell you this. I'm going to put a towel down because the computer folks don't like to hear from me if we get something on my keyboard, you know, like what animals do sometimes. <laughs> That would happen totally. But look at this beauty. This is an Eastern box turtle. That's Miss Sharon. Hey, darling. And you can tell she's very, very scared right now. Not at all. She is so <laughs> used to being around people. I use her all the time in class. But you'll notice about Sharon, she's missing her little arm. Oh, so nice. Sharon was injured. And this sounds really, really bad, but it's true. She was injured by a lawnmower. Yeah. A lawnmower. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. And it's it's awful to think about that, but I tell people that because it's a true story. So she was in the grass at someone's home and she was injured by that lawnmower. And just amazing to think about how close that came to her head. But she was taken to a vet. The veterinarian operated on her and removed the rest of her arm. And now she's a permanent resident with us. The nature center that got her calls me up a lot when they have different animals. And they said, Ranger Nick, we've got a box turtle that is non-releasable. Would you like it for your teaching? Oh, sure. So I fell in love with Sharon. She can't be released because in the United States in the winter, these guys hibernate. So they dig underground and sleep all winter. Well, without that arm, she can't dig. So she stays inside with us during the winter. And then in the summer, we have a big pen out back of our house that we put turtles and things and so she goes out and runs around out there you know but <laughs> this injury has created such a buzz among my students there's such an empathy toward sharon and what happened to her but what happens is my students would love to use her and hold her when they're teaching and presenting in my class well then a teachable moment happens and it's the reason i put this towel down on my desk because a lot of times Sharon, and I hope you don't do it this morning, a lot of times Sharon just kind of like goes to the bathroom 
while you're holding her and you're teaching with her. When it happens. Watch, it happens. Right, that's right, that's right. When I watch my students teach with her and that happens from the moment that happens forward, their teaching is better. It's like, okay, this turtle just peed. I can't help it. I laugh about it as a presenter. The class laughs about it a little bit and we move on. They become conversational. They become more relaxed and they just kind of become flexible. And I think that as a teacher, I, I'm not saying that if you struggle with speaking anxiety or your students do, I'm not saying go, go get an animal and hope it goes. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, peace saying, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm saying that stuff happens. And when it does, we can either capitalize on it or we can ignore it. And if something unplanned happens, if you're teaching outdoors and you find some insect or some animal or something happens that's not planned, I would encourage you to capitalize on that moment. Let's talk about that. Let's set the lesson plan aside for a bit and let's address that. And sometimes in my classes, I will even plant teachable moments. I'll make it seem like to my students that this was not planned, but it was. Like I'll put something in the woods where I know that we're going to be going in class that day and we will find that thing. What do you know? You know? <laughs> So it's kind of neat to think about that. Yeah, so. No, but it's absolutely fantastic what you're saying, because I think it's so true. A lot of the time, especially at the beginning of teaching, you want to, everything to be so perfect. And, and we take ourselves also as teachers very seriously, you know, a serious profession. We've got to be respected and, and we've got to be really, really professional. And as you say, to celebrate mistakes as teachable moments and kind of laugh at ourselves as well. And, and when students see us laughing at ourselves, then they immediately kind of relax as well. Um, and to take that forward, it's just fantastic. Especially, I've got to take on what you're saying as well, to plant these teachable moments also in class is such a brilliant idea as well. And it helps us overcome our fear, as you say, of speaking in public, which is a, a really big fear, like the fear of flying, isn't it? Public speaking is one of the top fears that, that students have. So that is amazing. It really is, you know, and, and I just find with animals because they are so unpredictable that if you have a, a dog at home that's nice around folks and you wanna bring it into class, I think that kind of stuff will even improve the rapport that you have as a teacher with your students because they'll see you as more of a normal person. You know, it, it sounds so funny, but when they see their teacher interacting with an animal, it brings out a different kind of personality, I think, in you as a teacher. And it, I think it would make your students less anxious around you if they are intimidated to ask a question or approach you. Sometimes as a college professor, I, I hear that you know, some students are nervous to ask a question in class. Now, I would be mortified if I heard that about me because I don't think I'm very intimidating, I hope. But I want to create an environment that's welcoming. And I feel like the animal and that interaction with the teacher creates that sense of rapport and it's very, very comfortable. So it, it is nice. And so, so Sharon is just so nice to use in class. And so my students really gravitate toward her. And again, I, I really think it addresses public speaking anxiety because the students will tell me, not only does Sharon do things that are unpredictable, and they're just kind of looking around and things, but when they're holding her, it takes the attention off of them and puts it onto the turtle or whatever they're holding, and it makes them more relaxed. And I think that public speaking is such a life skill. It's such a career skill, and everybody has some level of anxiety. And I always encourage folks, get something in your hand to use to teach about. And that's going to help you. So I love it. So there's Miss Sharon. So true. Right. Oh, it's so so true, Nick. I mean, uh, talking about animals, I love Sharon as well. She's like really gorgeous. Like focus. Look at it's that. so true. Using like a, a, um, an animal. I mean, uh, teachers. A lot of teachers use, for example, puppets or other theatrical props, for example, in class. And even if it's not an animated animal, but like mm -hmm. a puppet can be treated like in, in the same way. You know, the attention is on is on the puppet. It takes the attention off you, and it helps create that rapport with students as well. So it's just. Uh, I love it, but bringing a real animal in is is like an, another level. Another level. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Miss Red. I tell you what, I'm gonna put Miss Sharon back, and I'm gonna put her back in her little box. And incidentally, before I do, I, I'm putting her in a box. It's a container. She doesn't live in there. But they don't call her a box turtle because you put her in a box when you find her. <laughs> Sometimes folks will say, "Is that where she gets her name?" Well, they call her that because I'll just show you on her little belly. 
there's a little line that runs across her belly right there. And I'm sorry, sweetie, why are you making me look at the ceiling? <laughs> So this little line is like the hinge on a door and she can close this and she's waving at you there. She can close that when she's really scared and fold up kind of like a box. She can tuck her legs. Really? In. Yeah, so that's why they call them box turtles is because they're, they're one of the few turtles that can totally do that, you know, and close themselves in their shell and shut their little door. So that's where she gets her name. Amazing. And yeah. she lives up to a, a grand old age. Turtles live for many, many years, don't they? Oh my older gosh. than us. So, so Sharon is 14, and we know that from the vet. And you can, there are rings on a turtle shell that you can count the rings, like the rings on a tree, and it's an estimate of their age. But we know that box turtles, on average in the wild, live 80 years in 18. the wild. So in captivity, where she's safe and there's not predators that can get her. I'm thinking, well, I know for sure our kids are going to take the turtles that we have once my wife and I are gone. So it's a long-term pet. <laughs> it's a long-term pet. Responsibility. Yeah. It really is. Wonderful. And, you know, it's, uh, that's cool. So I think celebrating these teachable moments, I think capitalizing on unplanned things is so important. Another thing that I think is that has gotten me some notoriety, I think, on our campus, and it's something that I've kind of toyed around with stopping and not doing anymore is giving feedback when I grade students. So all of us as teachers spend a lot of time, and I think it's a thankless thing. I think parents and folks don't realize how much time a teacher spends outside of class, whether it's planning, whether it's working with parents, whether it's grading. I mean, to do it well, that takes a lot of time. And I spend a lot of time grading, but I gotta tell you, I really enjoy it because I see what my students are getting out of my lessons. And it gives me feedback to know, and I'll blame myself, if a quarter of my students are missing something on an assignment, that's my fault. You know, I didn't teach it well enough. I need to go back and revisit this. Well, in my classes, when my students get a 90% out of 100 or more, I put a stamp on their assignment. So I have all these different stamps. Like a like reward, a, like a, a yeah, reward like a, stamp. A little like stamp. a motivational stamp. That's right. That's right. So I have a little, I have a little ink pad and a little turtle stamp that I put on there. And I might write, and this is what's so corny. I might write excellent work, you know, <laughs> like on their assignment. And, hand it to them. and so at first I thought, these are college students. These are students working on a PhD at a university. <laughs> I'm putting a turtle stamp on their assignment. But I got to tell you, the students really, really get a kick out of it. I think it motivates them. I think if they didn't get a stamp on an assignment, they're going to do better on the next one to hopefully get a stamp, a turtle, a leaf, an owl, all these different stamps I have. And they'll kind of compare with each other, like what stamp they got. And, you know, it's just to see the excitement when students are getting, college students are getting an assignment back that has a stamp on it. I just feel like that is so cool. And I think it, it motivates them to do better on their assignments. And how much time does it take me to do? I mean, a couple of seconds to stamp that assignment and write some corny little line on there. You know, it's just, and I'll tell this story, this Brenda, I, and I share this in my TED Talk. So forgive me if you watch the TED Talk, yeah, that's the same story, but I gotta tell it. There was a time when I said, I feel like maybe the students, and I didn't know, but I felt like, maybe they're looking at this like it's too corny. It's just, come on, this is college, we're getting stamps. So I almost thought, nah, I'm gonna stop doing it. No, I'm just gonna grade it. And I, I just, I don't wanna be embarrassed and people think, why is he talking to us like a fourth grader when we're a college student? So okay. I almost stopped doing it. Well, one day in a class, I was handing back assignments. And in this class, there were a lot of athletes that took the class and there were football players, you know, college football, big thing in the United States. And there were a lot of football players that were in the class. And I was handing back assignments and I got done and I went back to my office and there's a knock at the door. And one of the football players is at the door of my office. And these guys are pretty big because they play football. And this guy, like he took up the whole door. I mean, he was big, <laughs> this big guy, big kind of tough guy, right? And he's standing there with this assignment in his hand. And he's like, hey, Ranger Nick, can I talk to you? And I'm thinking, okay. He probably wants to ask about why his grade maybe wasn't as high as it could be. 
he comes in and he shows me his assignment. He says, hey, I got a 91% on this assignment and there's no stamp on it. I didn't get a stamp. And I look at this and there's this big football player guy standing here, this big tough guy who walks to my <laughs> office to show me he didn't get a stamp. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I must have forgot. So I stamped this little owl, I love owls. I stamped this little owl stamp on his assignment and I wrote owl standing work on his assignment, you know? And I That's give it back to this guy. And here's this big tough football player that walks out of my office so excited to get this stamp. And I just thought, okay, I had toyed around with the idea of not doing this anymore. But that right there showed me that I'm going to continue doing that forever because this guy mattered. It matters to students, even a big, tough football player that you would never think would do that. So I think it's pretty cool. It does. No, oh, I, I love that story. I, I really, really love that because nobody is too big for stamps and stickers and a, some, a reward motivation. Um, and, and, and what you're saying, I just, I, I so agree with you because sometimes teachers come to me and they say, well, you know, I've got like a, an eight, nine, 10 year old, they're, they're too old for, for, for motivational stickers. You know, what can I do to reward them? And I, I say, no, use the stickers. <laughs> nobody is too oh. old for, for stickers, you know, or stamp, um, a motivational stamp. And, and this, what you're saying now as well, you get up to university students and they're still really really motivated by your stats it's just proof that it works whatever age we are <laughs> isn't that neat i mean and you know I, I think in society we get so used to picking out the not so great things and what others have done you know mm -hmm. it, we're very quick to make a complaint about this wasn't right this wasn't done well and i think sometimes we need to pick out the things that are great and say hey i noticed something you did and that was really great and just what that can do for somebody's day and week and, and year is incredible. And so I and we have that power as teachers. You know, it, it really is cool. So speaking of giving feedback, I want to show you something else. So yeah. this is another animal that gives feedback to scientists in the United States because of where they live and because of their body. So this sounds kind of strange, but so this animal, I have this very fancy water bottle water, <laughs> normal water in this guy. I'll put that in the frame okay so just water i need to spray my hands with water to handle this little animal because its skin is very sensitive so my dry hands touching this animal's skin could damage its skin oh my goodness so, yeah so i'm gonna wet my hands but before i do that this sounds crazy too but I'm going to put on these gloves. You know, like it's like a, I'm getting all excited now. What is it? What is it? <laughs> I know. It's so funny. And this this little guy, I got to tell you, this looks, so we have two children at home, two little kids, a five-year-old little boy and a two-and-a-half-year-old little girl. And it's very, very exciting in our house. If you think I'm energetic, you should see our kids. I mean, they're <laughs> excited. But they love, I'm going to introduce you to Sanford. So they love okay. Sanford because Sanford, they think this too, because they told me, dad, they, they agree. They think Sanford is smiling. I think it looks like he's smiling. I'm going to show them to you. Here's my little bird clock chirping. Ah, there, there, there. <laughs> You've got I a zoo in your room. <laughs> yeah, like my office. I mean, you just cannot imagine, you know, what's in here. But so I'm going to spray my hands. Okay. And just get them wet with my gloves on. Now the gloves are important. I talked to a veterinarian. I didn't used to wear the gloves, but with everything today, with the COVID stuff and everything, this animal's skin is permeable. So things can pass through it. So I want to protect my hands from hurting him potentially. So I've got wetness on my gloves. I'm going to pick him up, take a look at his face. I just, I watch this. I think it's cool. I think he's cute. Mr. Sanford. Hey, buddy. I got to tell you, I, um, I talk to all these animals too. I know they can't hear me that well, but I talk to them all. Now look at that. Look at this I guy. This. So I was funny. expecting you to bring out this something really massive. I've <laughs> got this lovely little creature here. Oh my goodness. So I was expecting you to bring out a dragon there, Nick. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. This is, a, this is a big salamander. In the United States, it's one of the largest salamanders that we have. It's called a tiger salamander. And they call him that because of the beautiful stripes on his body there that you can see. 
And look at the face. I mean, look, is that not that little if it focuses in on his poor face? He does there. look like he's smiling. Yeah, he's got that cute little, <laughs> I don't know. I just, now I think everything's cute and adorable and I think we need to look out for everything. But some people might look at this and go, oh my gosh, that's just like a big wet lizard looking thing. Well, a salamander is an amphibian. So it's like a frog or a toad. So it starts out when it's a baby as breathing through gills, kind of like a tadpole. And then as it gets older and older, of course it breathes through lungs. And this guy is a male, so he's big. And male salamanders are much bigger than females. And he has this very, very long, beautiful tail that that signifies he's a male too. Males have much, whoop, males have much longer tails than females. And okay. Sanford has a special story with his skin because he is an indicator species. He indicates the health of the environment because if the environment has acidity in the rain or there's pollution in the water, his skin will show it. He'll have lesions on his skin. Sometimes salamanders can be missing toes or parts of their tail. And that tells a scientist very early that something is going on and we need to do something. So that's this guy. And he really helps me emphasize the power of feedback because he gives feedback to scientists, which I just think is so cool. And he's being a little bit wiggly here this morning for me, but look at how beautiful the coloring. No, he's beautiful. Kind of walking around with dad here and and my students just love him. And of course, my kids love him too. They just think he's so cool. He was donated to me from a, a center in Atlanta, which is a big city in Georgia. And um, he was much smaller than this. He has grown a lot. And I have been told by a herpetologist who works with reptiles and amphibians, expert, that Sanford's a little bit overweight too. So, uh, <laughs> you know, he eats very, very well at our house. He loves worms, earthworms. He loves to eat worms. And okay. when we find insects outside, like little, like a cockroach kind of insect or different things that live in the United States, I will catch them and put them into his tank. And he loves them. He loves to crunch on them. And he's actually kind of violent when he eats. He grabs things with his mouth and he shakes his head. You know, he's really, and just gulps it right down. And when he's done eating, you can visibly see his stomach is bigger. Like he's just sitting there all loaded up, you know? So isn't that neat? Mr. Sarah, I'm going to put you back, buddy, because you're cool. Oh, I love him. Isn't that cool? Absolutely gorgeous. So he's got to go on a diet now then, Nick. I You've got know, to put him on a I diet. Know. You know what? <laughs> These guys, I, I tell you, I totally spoil all the animals we have at home. And I think that's great because they ended up with us and they get to have a, a good time. And you know another thing I'll say? I really think that our animals that I use at home are happier because I really think they realize the difference that they're making. I think they know that they're coming out with, with dad a lot in front of audiences and they get to see people and they get to interact. And it's like a person that's elderly and is still active, is still seeing folks and doing things. They tend to live longer than if they're just really? in a place by themselves. I really think using the animals as a teaching tool, like I do, it, it just brings a lot of joy to people, but I really think it matters to them too. I think they know what they're doing. They're making a difference. So pretty cool, you know? No, that's amazing. Fun. That's amazing. Yeah. It's, it, I, I love this story. And do you have your students though, any students who are, when you come into lesson with your animals, are they afraid of any animals that you bring in? That's do a great question. Yeah, so they, they are. And the, the snakes that I have tend to elicit some anxiety at first. But it's really, really neat when I take a snake, and I have different sizes of snakes. I have a smaller king snake at my house, and I bring her in, and we slowly get to see her and maybe get to touch her tail a little bit. And, and after a little while, a student will warm up, and they'll all of a sudden they'll want to hold her tail up, and then they'll want to hold her whole body. And so it's, it's really uh, it's neat to see that transformation. Now, there are other students that I'll never change their fear of snakes. And that's okay. okay, you know, so I will tell them on days when I'm going to bring a snake in and they'll kind of be in the back of the room. They'll move to the back and I get it. That's okay. Um, but so you never force them onto them. You never say, oh, look, she's really, really friendly. Come and touch her. You just leave them with their no. fear. You say, okay, don't worry. You I, know. And you, that's, that's something that I think we have to be careful with. With anything we bring into a class, we don't want to add noise. We don't want to add a distraction because they're afraid of it. So at the start of a semester, I'll ask the class, okay, I need to know, 
and this is a, an individual kind of thing. They don't announce it. I need to know if you're afraid of snakes. Tell me. So I will tell you personally on the days I'm going to bring a snake in that I'm going to have it that day because I just don't want to scare them because there are folks that are very, very nervous around snakes. And I get it. You know, it's, that's OK. Yeah. But it's the animals help so much in creating that environment in class. Yeah. They really, really do. And to and help they, overcome their fear as well for some children who maybe are a little bit fearful but then it, it, seeing them um, and you interacting with them and explaining about them it does help children overcome their fear in fact it's it's uh, what you're saying i can see so many parallels with with teaching english with with what you're saying with with not forcing um english you know come and join if, if you have a new group of, of of children and you're forcing them to come in and join in in an activity or something I'm saying no yeah. just, you know leave them to observe to to warm up to what you're doing but using as you're saying or animals or puppets or whatever theatrical props that you're you're bringing into your lesson to help them um feel more engaged and more encouraged to to, to study with you but uh no it's it's very very interesting what you're saying i see so many parallels in in other subjects not just with, with teaching with animals but it's 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 fascinating absolutely fascinating I'm so glad to hear it thanks yeah you absolutely and, you know, i tell you i never would have thought about myself teaching with animals and using this in terms of teaching a language but this is so interesting to me i'm learning a lot about what you're doing and I'm just so glad that this has provided a little bit of inspiration to you to think about how you could do what you're doing differently and, and have even more fun as a teacher. Because I think that's the secret. I think that when you think about that favorite teacher, and we talked about a few minutes ago, it really comes down to their ability to create that welcoming environment and their ability to care. I really think that. And I tell that to a lot of new teachers. I say, listen, I know you may be nervous about not knowing everything about a particular subject that you've been asked to teach in a course for a year in seventh grade or whatever. But I said, the thing is, you got to have a foundational knowledge, yes. But realize that so much more about an effective teacher is the personality, is the environment, is the caring, genuinely caring about the people you're teaching. And if you can get that down, you're going to be successful. Your students are going to really get more out of this. And what a wonderful so thing. True. It's so just, true. And yeah. and using, you know, what do you think about using humor also in what are your thoughts on using humor in the classroom to help engage oh. with your students? Of course. I I uh, I laugh at myself all the time. <laughs> I can't help but get excited about what I'm doing. And I will do things, just goofy things, do the stupid dad joke kind of stuff, show a goofy video of something and talk about it. You know, I think when we're laughing at something. We're only thinking about the thing we're laughing at and nothing else in that moment. So I'm being effective at turning down that noise, at reducing those distractions, if my class is laughing about something that relates to the subject of the day. So when I ask teachers, and I've, I've done this in interviews before, I'll say, now listen, if I walked by your classroom and there was a window in the door of your classroom, if I walked by, how would I know that effective teaching is happening? What would I see and hear through that window? And they'll talk about smiles and laughter and teamwork and engagement and this idea of enjoyment for learning. And I think it starts with the teacher. You know, I, I'm forever amazed that at a university like this, where it's, it's really students are number one, that's why we have jobs here. But there are folks and colleagues of mine that will say, oh, you know, I, I have to go and teach class. And I think, well, if you're not excited about that, do you think your students are going to be excited? And you are the one that can change that. You can be more excited about it, change it up so you're having fun, and then your students are going to have fun. So I think it's on us to create that environment where we have fun. And I think your students are going to follow. I think it, it is just so contagious, that idea of enthusiasm and enjoyment, and what a cool job it is to get to basically, you are the CEO of your classroom. You get to do things that you want to do within reason that bring joy to your students and make an impact. I mean, I can't think of a cooler job. I really can't, you know, we're just so fortunate. I was I, I was going to actually ask you one uh, one last question, but sure. I think you've answered it with what you're saying now. I was going to say, if you could go back in time would you change your your path for yourself of your your profession your career and if, you, if so would you would you do something else what would you do 
<laughs> you know, I tell you what, I joke about this. My great grandmother, who lived to be almost 100, ever since I was little, little kid, she used to call me her preacher boy. Here comes my little preacher boy, you know, like a pastor in a church, you know. <laughs> I feel like I've always enjoyed being in front of other people and seeing their reaction to things that I'm saying and their smiles and, and bringing that joy to folks and, and the power of what of one person can do in a room, just like what Ranger Bill did in that classroom that day. I, I bet that if I wasn't a teacher, I bet that I would have pursued something in in ministry or being a pastor or something where I could have that kind of mentoring relationship on others and at least get to every week, stand in front of a bunch of folks and and preach about something. I, I just I think that's powerful. I uh, I was given I think the gift of gab. <laughs> I, uh, I I never I'm never at a loss for words. I just I love talking. There are very few things that I'm good at. I'm not very good at many things, but I'm a little bit decent at talking. And so I feel like that is the gift that I should give back to others. And that's what I do. And that's what we do as a teacher. So I just, I, it's a lot of fun, you know, just like today, this is just, it's so neat that we get to share a passion together and I hope bring some smiles to everybody out there and Absolutely. just get them thinking, man, how many cups of coffee does that guy drink a day? <laughs> two, two, max, this size, not like a big one, two of these. I just am naturally excited about Just that. naturally enthusiastic about it, I think. And can I just ask you one more one more question? Because I, I don't want to let you go, um, Ranger Nick. I, I've got to get everything from you. It's just yeah. so, so interesting talking to you. Um, if you had some advice to um, a fellow teacher, a newbie teacher, who was, who was having problems, maybe a few issues in class with classroom management, who wasn't able maybe to connect so much with their students. What advice would, would you give that teacher? I think that um, getting feedback from the students in an anonymous way, whether it's somebody else coming into that class and having a, we can almost call it a focus group with the class without that teacher in there to talk about, listen, let's talk about some of the things, the ingredients in this recipe in this class that are really tasty and some of the ingredients that just don't seem to be working somebody else comes in and asks that question and then the secret is relaying that feedback to the teacher and then the teacher's got to act on it so that i found even an anonymous kind of a mid-semester reality check kind of like a stop start continue thing a ticket out the door kind of thing you know where anonymously students can share how things are going instead of doing it at the very very end of a course of a semester of a, of a unit whatever it is when there's not enough time to make changes because we're at the end, I find in a genuine way, if you notice that things aren't working right and you hit the pause button and you say, I need to get some feedback genuinely and then act if you can act on that feedback. Tell the class, listen, gang, I really appreciate what you shared. I know that sometimes we have a hard time connecting on certain subjects, but I've learned some things from you and here's what I've learned. So on a PowerPoint slide or on the board, here's some of the main themes that came out of what you said, everybody. And then the secret is, here's what I'm gonna do about it. So, you know, we can collect data from students, but we've gotta be willing to change and act on at least some of that stuff. You can't say, well, you guys told me that all these things weren't that great, but I can't do anything about it, sorry. You gotta be willing to be flexible and say, okay, I get it this style of learning is not working for some of us. Okay, so we're gonna try something. I think they will meet you halfway and realize that you in a very, very genuine way, and I use that word a lot, are caring about what they think and you're trying to meet them where they are. I, I really believe I've seen it with middle school students, high school, and of course with college students. If we come to them and say, look, I really wanna connect with you and I'm, I'm not trying to butt heads with you or I really want this to work, I think that they'll see that. I mean, Absolutely. Really Absolutely. Really and, and what would you suggest like for, for even younger kids who, who aren't old enough yet to give you that feedback? Is it a good idea to perhaps um, just kind of try and understand their, their own body language to, to, to get their feedback from their body language, see how interested they are in what you're studying and then try and make those changes? What would you suggest for, for y much younger kids? That's a great question. I think for younger kids, I would go back to the uh, planting a teachable moment thing and doing okay. things that, that aren't planned all of a sudden 
And then revealing afterwards, okay, I got to let you know a secret. This was totally planned. I put this thing here that we were talking about, but I did it because, you know, it seems like sometimes it's hard to get excited about photosynthesis because I know it's really technical, but I thought we just needed a little break. Sometimes it's, all right, I want everybody to stand up. We're going to do this goofy little thing together. Doing these little mental shifts can show the students that you have noticed the nonverbals, the body language, you know, that, okay, yeah. we got to stop for a minute. And I, I just think that shows that you're observant and you're flexible and you're not scripted as a teacher. You know, we're not tied to that lesson plan. We got to be willing to set that aside and say, okay, let's talk about this for a second. We need a little bit of a break because I can see that some of us aren't in this right now. We got to do that. I just, and, but I think it remains flexible is so important. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's a really, really key word, flexibility of, of being able to, to change what we're doing when we see something that, as you say, that isn't working to, to don't continue this down the same path, but think, okay, let me see what isn't working. Let me try and change and be flexible about it. So, so true. Ranger Nick, I don't know how to thank you for sharing all of your 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 tips and your your teachings and your everything that you do. And also thank you also to your your little creatures who came as well right. to share with us this teaching right. experience. Hey, I Miss Rita, I really just appreciate the invitation and all the folks that are watching. If there's one person that this made smile or got them thinking about something different or maybe a little bit of inspiration. That's why we do it, you know, and I, I'm just so thankful that for the invitation and for you all listening and watching, that just means the world to me. It really does. And how cool is it that here I am in Athens, Georgia, USA, and you all are, are on the other side of the world or wherever you are, and we're able to do this. Isn't that neat? I just, I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. It, yeah, the technology. If we didn't have the technology, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. So, yeah, that's, it, it's great. It's absolutely great. So thank you. I will leave you to go. You have your, your students to go back to. Uh, so I'll leave you to go back to your teaching. Thank you so much again for, for joining us. And I hope maybe we'll, we'll maybe meet again and you can come back and talk to us more about your teaching experience as well. It's been really, really so useful and, and so to. inspiring. So thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.